Hello and welcome to this SEGOS webinar on the 58th day of lockdown in the UK anyway. Uh, we're clearly living in unprecedented times and over the next 45 minutes we're going to focus on how this is affecting our ability to build lasting relationships with our customers. My name is Francis Marshall, I'm the Managing Director of SEGOS here in the UK and I'm joined today by our subject matter expert and lead consultant on the commercial and selling side, Andy Patterson. Andy had an illustrious career in B2B sales before joining us uh, shortly after year 2000. Uh, he works exclusively on the sales and commercial side with some of our largest clients across a range of sectors. So uh, aviation, IT, logistics, SaaS as part of IT, manufacturing, and he's even been known to work in the rock crushing business. So a lot of experience there for us to pick on. And so I'd just like to start by welcoming, welcoming you, Andy. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Francis. That's a, a great ramp up. Thank you. <laughs> That's OK. Um, I'll take my check later. So over the last few weeks, obviously, we've had a lot of conversations with our clients and they have a lot of concerns, a lot of issues, uh, naturally. Uh, and it's boiled down into these four key questions, which is what has prompted us today to put together this very short webinar. Um, but before we get into those, those key questions, let's just look at, at the macro picture. I don't want to depress you too much, but I do want to look at the macro situation first. So here we have um, a view, if you like, it's a survey of surveys done by PwC. So they've looked at um, from what they believe is the most pessimistic, uh, the Bank of England up to their soft landing um, assessment of the impact on GDP of the coronavirus pandemic. And as you can see, there is a good range there from four or five percent up to 14, 15 percent. And I've personally seen a lot more pessimistic um, outlooks than that particularly when you get down to a sector basis. But we're salespeople, we're sales directors, sales managers here today. And so what matters to us is, is if you like, a shorter term horizon. So we need to look at it quarterly um, and see how this is going to pan out. So let's look further ahead, but on a quarterly basis. So this is just purely using the PwC data. Um, we all know we've hit the bottom of this bump, or we hope it's the bottom of the bump. Um, in Q2 this year, and this shows quarter by quarter what's expected to happen uh, through to, if you like, the next normal. Now, there will be winners and losers, and it's how we adapt and how we respond to this situation, and most importantly to our customers, that determines what happens next. But both of these scenarios definitely show a recession. So how have businesses reacted to this, Andy? Andy, what have you seen? Well, thanks, Francis. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, at the moment, the, um, the, the businesses that I've been uh, dealing with are in one of these four stages. Uh, the, the early stage, and some are still in this stage, is they're just trying to secure their business. They're completing orders. They're fulfilling contracts. They're trying to work out uh, how to, to furlough or how many uh, staff to furlough. Um, they're securing funding. Uh, they're doing the here and now. Most, however, have moved on from that and they're, they're stabilizing. They're realizing that there is a, a short to medium term uh, glitch here. And they're, they're looking at how best to stabilize the business, to operate effectively. If you believe the ONS, those companies that are still operating, are operating at around about 25% of the revenue that they were generating in 2019 in quarter two. And all sectors have been hit very hard. There are very few companies that are experiencing a lift in business. Andy, uh, Andy, now, Andy are they operating? Yeah. They're not operating at 25%, surely 75 or? Yeah, it's 25% left in 2019. Yeah, you're right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And, yeah, just, just to that point, I mean, the, the, they are actually starting to think, those companies that are still operating are starting to think 
about how to re-engage and, and whether this means that they're opening up uh, you know, digital channels of communication with their customers, are they building new uh, um, supply chains, are they using different channels to supply, um, but they're building towards a release from lockdown and, and trying to give themselves an advantage when things start, start moving again. There are very few that have yet thought about what will happen in 2021 and beyond. What is the next normal going to be? And I think that's because there's just so many uncertainties being faced. Yeah. Okay. So, so if that's the marketplace and some of the things that you're seeing, um, what? How are companies reacting to that? Okay, we know the macro, the four S's, but how are they actually reacting? Well. It's interesting. I mean, there are a few clear changes that are happening, and some which I think will last a lot longer than the current crisis. I mean, clearly the, the lockdown period will end at some point, but then we're going to go into a period of recession based on those uh, those figures, and which will hopefully be short, but certainly will not be normal. Um, some of the things that are happening at the moment are that the, the companies are realizing that the global supply chain that they've been using has not served them terribly well over the last two or three months. It's been relatively fragile and, and certainly not agile. Uh, and so they're looking at near sourcing or bringing things back more locally. And the other very marked change is the, their attitude to risk and the risk associated with change. So companies are becoming much more risk averse and they're either because they don't have the people to make the changes anymore or that the perceived risks have changed are just too great and that's creating quite a bit of inertia and certainly a difficulty for those sales teams that are maybe trying to become accredited suppliers yeah well certainly your first two s's are all about preservation of capital but so so can you give us some specific examples of what you've seen change yeah, a, a, good, a very good example of this would be uh, when you see procurement starting to control the buying process, um, and that's very much about risk reduction. Um, and beforehand for them, it might have been quite easy for them to maybe ignore the, the, the hidden value within an offer and just focus on price. But now that that lower price has shown some of the reasons behind it, maybe lower levels of service, lower levels of support, Maybe a lack of local people, especially with furloughed uh, employees, a lack of local people to, to help and, and maybe higher levels of automation in terms of help desks and the ability to fix problems. Those weren't so visible when supply chains or, or product support weren't under stress. But as many companies are resizing or furloughing, those cracks are starting to show. That's an interesting perspective. And, and so how does this affect the type of relationship suppliers need with their customers. There must be some kind of change coming. Of course. I mean, the, the, the added complication to this, of course, is it's getting more difficult for sales teams to get the focus of the key stakeholder groups. I mean, how do you meet them, for instance? That's true. That's true. Um, so building a footprint is difficult. So what do you suggest that people do? Well, yeah, that's the, that's the key thing. Building the footprint is the key thing. And in fact, we've seen quite a change in our customers in the way that, for instance, people are running meetings. And to a large extent, their availability for meetings, both on the supplier side and also the, the customer side. Uh, speaking personally, for instance, I haven't had a single virtual meeting request refused by any of my contacts. And and some of these might only be 15 minutes, but that's okay to be honest. And 15 minute video meeting is, is better than a phone call and, and more realistic than a tour drive each way to, to have a face-to-face -face meeting. So yeah. there's one change that is, is happening. And to be honest, um, last week I was coaching somebody, it was a, a global account manager from one of our customers. And their issue was that their customer had pretty much shut down the normal levels of contact. In fact, procurement had, had put an iron grip over the buying process and decided to, to de-risk the business by just not engaging with new suppliers. And this global account manager had had business with them and wanted to expand into other areas, but was being actively stopped by procurement. And it, it's a tough one. 
you know, do you risk damaging the relationship you have for business that you might not get? Or do you use this opportunity to reset the rules of engagement and move directly to the people you need to? And this is maybe where the fourth S comes in. This could maybe be the time that we reset our relationships and, and engage in a, a less transactional way with our customers. So, so you've talked a bit about how our relationship develops with the customer, but what about how the customer sees us? Because surely that is important. We've seen that evidenced in the way that people have prioritised their spend through the first two S's. Absolutely, Francis. I mean, that, this is probably one of the, the, the fundamental aspects of, of the sales relationship. We, um, we carry out sales activity and we believe that we're doing the right thing, but how often do we actually ask, what does the customer think of us? What is their perception of our sales activity? And, and it may be that there are plenty of sales organisations out there that are quite happy that their, their sales force are seen as product experts. I would suggest that if that is the case, then we're not operating at the level that is, 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 is possible or potential. And certainly we're not making the most of any relationships we have. Um, to in effect save our, our situations in this, I'd be suggesting that we need to be a little bit more uh, engaged with the customer. Think about it from the customer's point of view. We're not just selling product, we're building a relationship that is designed to help the customer. And as a result of helping the customer and getting closer to the customer, we get to sell some product or a service. Uh, and the, the slide that you've got in front of you, which I hopefully everybody can see, is just having a look at what their perception might be of, for instance, a, a product demonstration or a problem solver in level two, which is quite often a reason for uh, engagement. Level three, you might never get there, but if you're a trusted advisor, which is a phrase we, we, we all know, then they do regard you as having some compelling value and having a real need, you're essential to their operation. So Andy, um, can you just go back to that slide for me? Sorry, I, I just wanted to quickly ask you a little question about it, yeah. So when I look at these columns, is it, it's not you're either level one, either or level two or level three, don't they, do they build on each other? They, they, they can they can build absolutely and it may well be that uh, uh, you you build when times are good and everything is going well you're sitting at level two but all of a sudden you don't have the level of access to your your customer that you used to have and you drop back a level so you decide you make the decision is that a level you're comfortable with will that get you to where you want to be i think the fundamental thing here is that you know, it's it's a truism that you end up with the, the relationship with the customer that you deserve. And therefore, if you're doing the things that justify a level three relationship, it's because you're doing the, the things that the customer is willing to accept you as a, a, a fundamental part of their business. I like that. I like that. And I'm going to be saying that at the next sales team meeting. You get the relationship you deserve. I really like that. Um, so let's move on. And so how have, how have we seen businesses change the way that they buy? Well, this, this certainly, as I said, there's increased inertia. You know, you know the better the devil you know, uh, let's not create additional work or, or increase risk uh, by changing suppliers at the moment. Um, and that's affected sales teams because they need to be much clearer in building their sales case. You know, it has to be a clear and immediate advantage for the customer. If there's no reason to change, then why should they? Yeah, um, and so what does that mean for sales teams? How's it affected them? Well, well, let's look at, for instance, uh, maybe you're having shorter, but hopefully more frequent meetings. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at how can you make those meetings more effective and, and, and in effect more profitable for you. And, and this takes us to the core of the issue is, planning for these shorter meetings. I mean, we can't waste time, uh, but in my mind, there are some rituals that we have to observe, and especially in this lockdown period. Uh, I'll, as an example, for instance, we know that people have changed. I mean, they're, they're working from home, they're maybe working in a family environment, they're, they've, been, they've been displaced from their normal office environment. So as a ritual, 
I use a health check question at the start of all my meetings. I genuinely ask about how they are and how their family are. And, and for me, that's a ritual of a virtual meeting. And, and, it's, and it's something I do each time. Yeah, but I mean, we've, I'm sure everyone on this uh, call has had the phone call from a cold caller who says, hi, hi, Francis, uh, how are you today? And all of that kind of stuff. It comes across as massively disingenuous, doesn't it? Yeah, it can do if it's not a genuine, if it's part of just a sales pitch, if it's uh, if it's a form of words that are, are just, uh, you know, to, designed to get you into your sales pitch. But, you know, why wouldn't you genuinely ask somebody that you want to have a relationship with how they, they, they feel? But to be honest, that's not the key point. I mean, they, the key ritual for me uh, is I've got to make sure that I set an objective for each meeting, even if it's 15 minutes long. And I, I don't just mean a, a personal objective, I mean, that's important, but an objective for the customer. I mean, what do I want them to see or feel or do or understand as a result of the meeting I've just had with them? And that's where, you know, that's where I can start putting in content. And they, to be honest, if I, if I don't know what I want them to, to do as a result of this 15 minute meeting, I'm not ready for the 15 minute meeting. I'm not ready to make that call. You're right. OK. And so what you're what you're saying is and I want to really pick this point up because i um, not heard it said that way before. Your objective is what you want the customer to do as a result of your conversation with them that day. Is that right? Yeah, it's a great way of measuring the effectiveness of your of your meeting. Uh, if you if the customer does what you plan for them to do, you must have put something into that meeting that gave them the reason for doing it. They're not going to do it just for the relationship. You know, right. you've, you've given them a valid reason and you've, you've explained or demonstrated the value of them doing that. And, and that's what I really mean about this idea of, of, of selling the relationship. You know, in, in many cases, the, this, the relationship with a buyer is, is based around the performance of the, the product or service. And, and it's quite transactional. Uh, and, and if everything is performing well, then you know, the relationship's okay. But at the moment you have a problem with the, the product or the service, then it's not so good. And any opportunity you have to decouple the relationship from these transactions and allow it to be a reason to, to trade in itself has got to be good. And yeah. what makes you, for instance, what makes you better or easier or more trustworthy in the eyes of the customer? And for me, it's, 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 it's frankly amazing. When I talk to salespeople about why customers prefer them, they quite often explain it in terms of their product or service. You know, there's a lower failure rate or, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't talk about the relationships. They talk about product. And then what happens if there is a product or service failure and you don't have a good, deep and wide relationship to, um, to fall back on? Uh, to leverage and support you through the difficulty and i think this is the time during this lockdown period where we can really start building this relationship so i'm sure there are many dynamics to a relationship so for example where you're talking about um broadening and deepening it uh and if you all you do is talk about the product or all you talk about is um price etc that's one dimension of the relationship the other dimension of course is how their business benefits and ultimately how they look good within their business but what about the mindset of a buyer what what's how do, how do you look at the mindset of a buyer and how do you think that's changed recently well i, I think i'm a bit of ahead of you there uh, francis because i've already been thinking about <laughs> these buying motivations and uh, and to be honest uh, and this this for me is, is is fundamental i think over the last oh, 10 plus years every time i've spoken to a sales team this is the thing that resonates with them because they start understanding how best to communicate with their individual buyers it we're we've got to be more sophisticated than believing that yeah hey we've got a value proposition which is a value proposition based on product that, that, that that's fine but it's not based on the customer and you really are relying on the customer to pick through it and find out the value for themselves and so it's no, you know, we can be more sophisticated even than think about a value proposition for a customer. What about thinking about a value proposition for an individual within that buying community? 
And this is why we start thinking about individuals buying motivations. And, and these are the things that I'm starting to see change as a result of the, the current lockdown and the current crisis. Andy, Over the last, Andy, yeah. if I may interrupt, I'm not sure your slide is built properly on the full view. Can you just check that for me, please? Um, one more. Oh, lots more. There we go. Great. And go back. Great. No, you're going forward. There we go. Ah, super. Lovely. Thank you very much. Sorry, I interrupted you in full flow there, but but you were just about to say um, about what they are and how you think they've changed. Yeah, I think that over the last 10 years, certainly, there's been relative stability in the marketplace, certainly since the last economic crisis. And so, therefore, these buying motivations have become almost default motivations. They've become buying behaviors if you like and then all of a sudden everything's changed and so therefore a lot of people have moved into what we call what we call coping behaviors and so these these motivations have changed so somebody for instance who was all about innovation wanting the next best thing wanting something new and creative and different to give them a market advantage that's now way too risky remember they're, they're trying to pull back on risk and so they've now changed the motivation and now what they're looking for is they're looking for safety and control and, and trust and, and evidence of, of use. And that's a change motivation. So if we don't change the way that we sell, we don't change the way we communicate to these people, we're actually putting our own block in, in, in the road. We're actually not communicating in the way that the, the customer wants us to talk to them. So it's a bit like some of the old fashioned communication stuff was about use visual, use auditory, that kind of stuff, or the Mayrabian stuff. But what you're talking about here is actually because you it's part of a person's convincer strategy is one of these or several of these motivations. We need to be flexible in the way that we talk to them so that so that they can see it demonstrated in the context of their buying motivation. Have I got that? The right way around. Yeah, yes, to a certain extent. I'm always slightly wary about asking salespeople to get fully involved in an NLP strategy. Oh, yeah, no, um, I'm not saying yeah. um, I'm not. But that said, what we are talking about is you're quite right to identify mirroring here because if you hear a customer starting to talk about um, support and service and guarantees and what happens when things go wrong, and you you keep talking about you know leading and different and new and you'll be the first customer to do this and it'll give you an advantage you're clearly not mirroring you're clearly not talking the customer's language so yeah. you know from that point of view yes we do have to listen and we we probably have to listen much much harder than we're used to to what the customer is really saying to us yeah. and the way that they're describing things so that's that's what i would suggest on that okay so that must therefore affect the way we put together our value proposition how do you see the value proposition changing going forward for businesses yeah it's it, it that's that's a great question and, and that's where we are starting to see some uh, some moves here um and to a certain extent it depends on where you are in the sales process um because you know it's you know is the customer still buying for instance you know you you may have got to a position in the buying process where you think right now we're ready to to move towards a close we've just got the final two or three tweaks in our our value proposition to to really hit home but the buyers actually moved away from the buying phase maybe they're maybe they're doing something there the entire organization is trying to stabilize their um their supply chain and they've stopped buying so you know we've got to be clear that when we're changing we're actually changing to help the customer and, and that's why i've got up here changing from product to customer focus make sure that what we're trying to do is actively seen as helping the customer succeed in what they're now trying to do not what they were trying to do last year or what they were trying to do even earlier this year everything's changed and so this idea of moving from sell to help how can we help the customer succeed rather than just how can we gain some revenue from the customer if we're successful and we help the customer succeed in what they're trying to do we'll get revenue from that because they will transact with us and that's going to require us to be much more agile much much more responsive to 
the way that the customer is changing the way that they make these buying decisions. You know, I've talked about de-risking. I've talked about procurement taking a, a more um, a more dominant role in this. Um, but also, we want to make sure that they're comfortable that what happens after they make a decision is also de-risk. So this idea of high touch, it may not be you've got local people, but they certainly know that you will have high frequency of contact. You are there. You are you are there to lead them through. We, I hear quite a lot uh, companies talking about you know how do we push towards a decision, and there's the other aspect of how do we pull the customer towards a decision. Maybe we lead them towards the decision. We show them what it would be like as they move to each individual phase of their buying process. And so I think that's where the value proposition changes is that. Some of it will change in terms of the way you communicate, but it will also change as to who you communicate with. And so your, your stakeholders, not just procurement, but the people who have the need, you've got to keep that high touch. They've got to feel that you're still listening, you're still offering that value. Yeah, for sure. So, so that brings us, if you like, to the, to the four questions and, 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 and touching on it touching on each of them to a small amount of depth. But if we're thinking as a sales manager or sales director and we're saying, OK, I'm I'm at home, my team's at home. I've got a bank holiday weekend coming up. What can I be thinking about? What would you recommend? Well, uh, I've got up here so maybe six takeouts from what we've just been talking about. Um, and I'll, I'll start at the top. Um, trusted partner. We've 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 heard this is this is not new, but what do we mean by trusted partner? I'll, an example for me would be if your salesperson says, I'm stuck, I've only got the one point of contact, I can't get through, you've got to ask yourself why. You know, why does their contact not feel confident in, in introducing them to their colleagues? What is it they're doing that makes their, their point of contact not feel that the, they're operating as a trusted partner? And maybe it's the fact that they've not tailored their value proposition. They're going with a, a very standard value proposition, maybe a me too value proposition. Maybe they've not tailored it to either to the company or the individual that they've delivered it to. And that could well be because they're still selling. They haven't thought about this idea of how do we help the customer succeed? And if you're not doing that, you're not going to be able to expand your, your network. Uh, and I know, and I know, I know. This is a major, major issue for for customers in terms of building a a, con, a relevant contact surface, uh, mm. where you are a, a go to resource, if you like, for that company, but within the context of, of what it is that you do and how you operate. Um, sometimes it's fear, though, isn't it? In the uh, in if you've got just one person that you've got the relationship with, they hang on to it until they they can see that they're going to look good by introducing you to other people within the organization uh, that, yeah that's a, that's a that's a perfect example of how you can build a level of trust they the, the person you're dealing with if they trust that you can make them look good i mean i'll give you an example they um one of my uh retained customers i i was used to uh, support this uh, this individual in his presentations to the the C-suite because uh, he knew that I could add to his credibility. He knew that I would make him look good. He knew that I wouldn't say anything that would you know make it difficult or embarrass him. Yeah, you know, great for me because I get that expanded network and I get you know a, a much higher level of recognition of what I was doing within the organisation, but also good for him. So you're right to identify. There's a win-win here, and. Maybe that's one of the ways we differentiate. If our competitors are just going sell, 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 and we are actively trying to build a relationship network to make us feel, to make us more trusted, to make the customer feel that during this difficult time we are there to help them. Hey, we're differentiating by the way we sell. We don't have to rely on our product to differentiate us. We're yeah. doing it by the way we sell. And Interesting. So, are we going to move on to the final thing there? Sorry, Andy. I'm going to say that takes me on to the final thing there. You mentioned the bank holiday. 
And I think you know I can give the people who are listening a little bit of work here because that fi the final thing here is to what extent are your sales teams ready for what's going to happen? Yeah. Do you want me to say this? <laughs> is that what you said? <laughs> okay. So yeah, so we've, we're giving away a couple of free tools uh, that you'll get by by the end of business on Friday. One is for you to enable enable you to think about your customers, key accounts or, or whatever way you want to see them. But where are they in the four S stages that Andy outlined at the beginning? Now, why is this useful to you? It's because you then can have that business conversation. Uh, you've got, if you like, a, a, a very simple framework, but you'll have some some good questions that you can ask your client to build that empathy, trust and understanding of their business. But of course, no amount of understanding is is going to work unless your sales teams are highly skilled in what they do and constantly developed. Um, so, you know, we don't want them to be like Premier League footballers coming out of furlough. <laughs> we want them to come. We want them to be there every day at the top of their game. And so we'll send you a checklist to, for you to start to think, help you organize some thoughts around how are the individuals in my team performing? Where are the gaps? What can I support them with? Uh, what other help might they need? So Andy's pulled those together. We'll be sharing that. Um, I'm going to make a shameless plug just for 30 seconds before we go to Q&A. Um, we've been delivering sales training for an incredibly long time, and it's always focused very, very specifically on the customer and the industry that they're operating in. Uh, we've we've been through a number of recessions doing it, and we've always helped our customers to survive and thrive through that. And since 2014, we've been developing these into digital formats. So there are e-learning and, and um, sprints around selling, but the, the flagship programs are high performance selling and key account management, which are now 100% available as a virtual experience. So it's still experiential. We've been doing it a long time, so we know the flaws and the pitfalls of doing it, and we will deliver a result for you and your business. So that's the end of the plug. Let's have a look at questions. So, uh, oh, great question um, has come through. Some of my sales managers are struggling with their teams working remotely. Any tips for them? Andy. You won't yeah, expect it. yeah um, it's interesting. Out of all the questions I thought would come through, that wasn't uh, that wasn't one of them. But um, yeah, it's I, I can understand exactly why that might be because you know salespeople they are they're gregarious by nature. They they it is about relationships and having to have a remote relationship must be really difficult. I think that what I would uh, suggest is that going just going back to some of the fundamentals and. And making sure that you're, you're planning effective uh, virtual calls uh, are, is, is probably the, 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 the grounding. You know, that as soon as you start having effective meetings, because you've planned the objective, you know what you're going to say, um, you, you come out at the back end and the customer's actually done something or agreed with something, your motivation increases and you start thinking, yeah, well, we can do this. I mean, we're starting to see this in, our, in ourselves. We, you know, Six, eight weeks ago, you know, we were all struggling with Teams and with Zoom and not really knowing how to do things. Now it's almost second nature and we we're quite motivated by it. So in terms of, you know, dealing with people who are stuck at home, yeah, it is difficult. Um, but the level of preparation, we're no longer traveling large distances. We can use that time to prepare better for, uh, for our meetings. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. And I, if I may just add a little bit, I mean, I think if they're struggling working from home, it's an opportunity from from a safeguarding and, and mental health perspective to ask to, to understand what that struggle means. If it's actually changing the skill set that they're using on a daily basis, then as a sales leader, your job is there to, to coach and develop them. Uh, and so, you know, I'd, I'd take some of the things we've done here and develop you know, some great questions. Um, uh, you know, around we, we ask sometimes we ask questions like, well, what happens if you never bought this product or ask those kind of questions just to develop their thinking muscle, because that's the first thing that starts to go. 
So take the framework that we give you and use that as a as a conversation. You've got six six elements there that Andy took through from trusted partner through to differentiation. You could actually make it as a theme for one of your team calls. Okay, well let's talk about trusted part partner. What are we doing to be trusted partner? Who's got great ideas? Those sorts of things I'd highly recommend. Uh, we've got another one came in, which I think is going to make you chuckle, Andy. It says, how should I adapt my account plans to see me through the period? <laughs> well, uh, whoever sent that through, well done for uh, having account plans in the first place. I think probably 60% of the customers I deal with um, don't have account plans. Um, I think that, well, I think we might have just covered off quite a few of those uh, in what we've been talking about. Uh, you know, quite simply within your account plan, where are your customers in in those four S's? You know, what are they doing to to stabilise, to, uh, to to set the, uh, the the new normal? What uh, what are they doing? What do you have to do? Um, what are you having? How are you getting your your footprint? You know, are you close enough to the people that you need to be close to? You know, are you sure that the people you're close to actually have influence? These are the, the parts of the plans that you may not have well developed, um, but you've now got time to sit back and think, okay, this is the time to reset the relationship. What do I really want from this customer? So some of the things that we've covered, but you know, just let's go back to first principles and make sure that you've actually got some quality in that plan. Yeah. But the question is, it's not what do I want from my customers? What does my customer want from me? So attributes would be things like, um, accessibility, professionalism, um, you know, understanding their business. You know, I, I saw that question as one about how how can I develop myself to be a better, a, a, you know, a better resource for my client, if you like. Well, yes, to a certain extent, you'll only get that by finding out, increasing the footprint, and finding out from different people within the the customer organisation what they're looking for. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you talked about a couple of things. They may also be looking for resilience, consistency, agility. Um, they may just be looking for somebody who's willing to sit and listen to them because they're going through a tough time uh, and, they're, and they're looking for some, some support. So there, there are a number of things in there, but you're not going to get there unless you actually start increasing the, the network that you're dealing with. Yeah. Interesting. Short story. I won't take long, but our printer, you can imagine that right now as a training company, we're not exactly printing very much. Um, and he phoned me about, I don't know, a week or two weeks into, into the lockdown. And I thought, here we go. He's just gonna say, when are you gonna be able to, to do this again and all that kind of stuff. And the reason I had that filter on the call was obviously I spend a lot of my time leading the business, dealing with, um, accountants and trustees of pension schemes who all seem to think that everybody else has to know exactly what to do next at the moment but it was a breath of fresh air he just said look i'm just ringing people to see a how they are b what are they what are they doing now and and how's it kind of shaking down for them uh, you know and and that call that i thought was going to be five minutes it was 45 minutes he shared some great ideas with me i shared some ideas with him um, and we've got a commitment now to catch up on a regular basis. And he shifted that transact. For me, it was a very transactional relationship. He shifted it very, very quickly um, by that one phone conversation. And that's how fast you can make a difference, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that's the, the ritual we were talking about. He, he phoned up and he just wanted to see how you were. You know, there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a, there's a personal connection in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, final question, okay, uh, that's come in. Um, how far do I push my customer for a commitment during this time, especially with a view to gauging future opportunities post lockdown? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I thought I'm, that. I'm not going to ask necessarily a, a, a question in the for the lockdown period, but it's a it's, it's just a almost a classic sales questions of like oh I feel I feel uncomfortable about closing. Well, I think that my belief is if you are in that position and you feel you're having to push, it's because you've not done something in the sales process. There's a gap somewhere, and you sense 
that the, the buyer is uneasy about making that commitment. So the, the, the obvious, you know, and to a certain extent, it's a trainer answer is go back. What have you not done? What have you, what, where's the value that's not been communicated? Why is the customer just feeling uneasy? And I mentioned it before, this idea of push and pull. Maybe one of the ways through is that you show the customer what it would be like after they've made the decision and get them to reduce that level of, I don't know, uh, uncertainty or hesitancy or, or, or fear about making that decision. Uh, and possibly the more you push, the more it feels you're trying to sell. And what we've been saying on this uh, webinar is that move from sell to help. Thank you, Andy. And I think on that note, I hope that this has been of some help. It's a rare opportunity to sit back for half an hour or so and just think about things a little bit more. If you want to talk to us, please get in touch and we will help you as much as we possibly can. But in the meantime, uh, enjoy the bank holiday we weekend, but most of all, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.